Hello and welcome to our program, Where God Weeps, a program where we talk about the situation of the suffering church around the world. Today we're going to consider the country of Mozambique, a country which is approximately four times the size of England, with a population of 22 million. To tell us the work of the church, the service of the church to the Catholics in Mozambique, it is my very great privilege to welcome Father Rafael Zapato. Father Rafael, thank you for being with us here today on our program. Thank you, Otto, for inviting me. Father Rafael, I'd like to ask you a little bit about your history, about the history of your family, about how the Catholic faith first came to your area. Uh, when we were speaking earlier, you told me that, in fact, your grandfather was the first one to convert to the Catholic faith. What was religion like in your village before you, your grandfather converted to the Catholic faith? Before our conversion, we relied, uh, we relied on our ancestors. We asked them to take our needs, our words, to God. So you believed in one God. In, yes. I mean, traditional African religions believe in one, one God. One God. But the intercessor then? Our ancestors, people who lived with us, know us very well, and they, we know them very well. They know what we need. They are in good condition to take our words to God. I see. Yes. And so, in a certain way, when Christianity arrived, there was already a, a, a receptive spirit because you already had an understanding of one God. It was only that, in this case, uh, Jesus was, <laughs> was the intercessor. Is yes, that right? yes, yes, yes. How was the reception? of your village to Christianity? Were they open to Christianity? Yes, and I hear people who look for anthropology saying that Makua, which is my tribe, is my language, are by nature religious. So we are very open to welcome the good news, the gospel. So it wasn't so difficult to convert, to evangelize in my area, since we are naturally open to welcome what is good news for us. Maybe if you can tell us what was it like growing up for you? Uh, what was village life? Uh, if you can just give us a picture, because for us just to have an understanding of your where you come from. My village is surrounded by mountains and uh, we rely on farming all the time. We grow up, we grow maize, we draw water from well. So very remote countryside, yeah. yes, yeah. and we have a bath on the river, so no rainwater, rain water, no clean or potable water. Yes, yes we grow no electricity. No electricity. Uh -huh. And so it's very isolated. Very isolated. And you're in the very north of Mozambique. Is Extreme that... north of Mozambique, when Mozambique was in war, undergoing the civil war, we rely our life, we, all the time we went to, we cross a border to Malawi to buy the first needs. When did you first have an understanding of God or the love of God in your life? Uh, in my local community, because while we are like a missionary always came in, in our church to baptize, celebrate wedding, and prepare young people to, for the first communion. And sometimes they mentioned, we need boys to be priests, you know, we are lucky in priests. So I said, ah, maybe. But that time was kind of flash. It wasn't so consistent yes. feeling. Yes. But the feeling, I can, if I can say improve it, <laughs> it, it happened when I was studying secondary school and I met a classmate who already was attending this kind of meeting for people we, we call in Portuguese vocacionados who are all called by God. Yes. And I'm lucky that he's a priest, he's vicar general, 
in my diocese, which is close to my diocese. Mm -hmm. And we are very friends. And this was the first step close. of your way to the priesthood then? Yes, yes, yes. And was your family proud or was it difficult for them to see their son going to the, to the seminary? Uh, since my family is Catholic, is strong Catholic, they always were happy. They were happy. Uh, maybe they were worried. They were worried if I would succeed or manage to achieve to be a priest, because some sometimes some, some people, some young started and left, and sometimes families feel pity and ashamed. So when I was ordained, they were, were very very happy. They were happy. Yes. What is your greatest joy in being a priest? My greatest joy in being a priest is to have given to church in Mozambique a large number of priests. Because I have worked as a rector of National Seminar of Theology in Maputo you were six, for six years. You were six years the rector in Maputo. Yes, I think I have given to the church in Mozambique about 50 priests. Mm. This for me is, is the greatest joy. Yes, I have contributed to my church. Yes. Yes, it wasn't only dependent, uh, it, 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 it depended on, only on me. It's God's work, but he worked through myself. Yes. And still you need more priests. We need more priests. You said, uh, I think we were speaking earlier, you have something like 75 seminarians in the seminary in Maputo today? Yes, this is the average every year. Uh, 75, sometimes 80 theologians, but for all Mozambique. In Mozambique, we have 12 dioceses. It's a big number in terms of how to keep them, but in terms of need, is still very few, small. Very small now. So it means that because I think the population of uh, Mozambique is about 22 million. Yes. So it means that actually one priest has a quite a large area to e cover. No. Yes. It's, yes. Uh, uh, large area and um, very often without me, me, means uh, all the car or no car and three parish, no in the same place. So it's big, it's very challenging. The importance of catechists, because uh, of course the lack of priests means that the lay people need to carry a greater share of the responsibility. Yes. And so the importance for catechists, how important are catechists uh, for you in Mozambique? I think the church in Mozambique is mainly maintained or is supported by catechists. During the civil war, they carry, carry on our church. Now we are in peace, we rely all the time on them. Because if a priest has, has uh, three parishes, very big and very distant from one another, he can't do anything without catechists. And in Mozambique, it's impossible to think church without catechists. It's impossible for us. Our church is based, is led by catechists. I would like to draw attention to one catechist in particular, and that is a famous catechist in the story of Mozambique, in the church history of Mozambique, and that is the catechist Cipriano, yes. uh, who gave his life for another. And Father, we're going to take a break, and we're going to watch now a small story on Cipriano, the Catechist. Estimates put the number of dead in Mozambique's 11-year War of Independence that finished in 1975 and the subsequent civil war that erupted shortly after and raged for 17 years at over a million people. An additional three million were condemned to a refugee existence. As Portuguese colonial rule slowly came to an end, and also under the Frelimo Communist Party regime and its conflict with the Renamo guerrilla, the persecution and violence affected also Christians. Many missionaries were expelled or left the country because of the fighting. The few remaining local priests had to take their place, whilst many scattered small Christian communities were entrusted to the care of lay catechists.
Cipriano Parita, a Mozambican from the Makua tribe, became a catechist during the war. He was born in the north of the country in the village of Napano into a Muslim family. He was, however, sent to a Catholic school at a mission in Mueira. In 1957, around his 15th birthday, Cipriano receives baptism and with time manages to inspire his family to the faith. On returning to his village, he begins to look after the local community. Ten years later, he marries and has seven children. My brother was very calm, patient and good-humoured. He lived a good life with his wife. His whole life concentrated on agricultural husbandry. Exactly so, as in the case of most of us, to have enough to put in the pot for oneself, the wife and the children. He was a hunter, used to catch forest animals in his nets, as well as pheasants and other birds. He also practiced a dance called Erenkeya. He organized dance evenings that people liked and to which they would come in the evening. Cipriano's life revolved around the catechism and the land. Cipriano, as a catechist, tried to be close to the people and their problems, to talk about the gospel in their language, understandable for everyone, and encouraging everyone to live a life of faith with faithfulness, in spite of the war, hunger, and the difficulties that Christians had to confront. The Nakala diocese in which he lived and worked lies on Mozambique's northern seaboard, where Christians live the life of a minority amongst an overwhelmingly Muslim majority. Cipriano was a man with a good heart. He was never against Muslims. He did not fight Islam. He never antagonized Muslims, and there was not a single Muslim who would fight against him. On August 28, 1984, Renamo guerrillas come to his village in search of Frelimo party secretaries and militia. They ask a certain old man, who is the party secretary in the village? He answers Cipriano and led them to his house. Cipriano denies the claim, but also refuses to give the name of the real secretary or militia members, knowing that they would face a certain death if he were to do so. When they came asking about the secretary, he told them, I don't know any secretary or any other boss, I don't know anybody, even though he knew them all and some of them were present there. Cipriano said, I cannot say who the secretary is, even if others charge me with making false statements. I followed them together with my brother-in-law. They gathered us together, set us down in groups and began to question us. Do you know this man? I answered, I do, he is a catechist. Then they asked Cipriano, who are they? He answered, they do not belong to the militia and they haven't had any training. I belong to the militia and the other one also belonged to the militia. Had he exposed us, we would have been killed there and then. If he had only revealed the secretary, he would surely have survived. He very well knew who the secretary was, because he wasn't unknown. In fact, he was very important in the area. Had he confirmed that we belonged to the militia when they asked him, that would have been the end of us. We would not have survived. Everyone fears death, but he was reconciled with it. At that moment, the guerrillas make a very radical choice. Seeing that they have been misinformed and Cipriano has refused to hand over the wanted men they were looking for, the guerrillas decide to kill both of them. Cipriano. 
When he sees that everything points to him losing his life, he asks for a moment to pray. He wants to ask God to strengthen him at this most difficult moment. The gorillas agree. The other one, Swati, a Muslim, also uses that time to pray. Sapriana goes inside the chapel and prays, not a few meters distance from everybody else. When he finishes praying, he comes outside and rejoins them. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to our program, Where God Weeps. It is my great privilege to be speaking with Father Rafael Zapato, the rector for six years in the seminary in Maputo, Mozambique. And we're speaking about the story of Catholics in Mozambique, and in particular, touching on catechists and the importance of catechists for the local church. Father Rafael, thank you for being again with us on our program. Thank you. I would like to touch a bit more on Cipriano, the importance of Cipriano as an example for the church and the role of catechists for the church in Mozambique. It was, uh, as far as I know about Cipriano, it was very good man, a good catechist, uh, committed with, in his performances, who gave his life to save or to protect somebody. Because as far as no rival arrived in this area, they wanted to uh, know where there was a secretary. In that time, it was very dangerous to be a secretary because it means to support the party in power. And he said, I can't, I don't know. They forced him, he said, no. He no, didn't no. give the he name. Gave them. Yes, even though so, the man was in the village. Yes, and they said, oh, pay attention, otherwise we will kill you. I said, I don't mind. Uh, so. Jesus said, the best way to love people, other one, is to give your own life. He, gave, he did the same. So this is a very good example. As I hear that the process to be beatified. beatified. Yes. I don't know what is the situation, what is the stage, but I think if this happened, it will be a boost yes. for other catechists. Yes, and a symbol for the responsibility yes. of the lay person yes. in, in, in this work of catechism. Yes. Father, we've also uh, known about the tragic history of the civil war in, in Mozambique. Yeah. What was your experience of this time of the civil war? Very sad experience. I couldn't start in 1995 because of the civil war. I missed the, the only train suitable for students, so I couldn't start. And when I came back, uh, I arrived home. I didn't f meet my family. They have fle fled because the rival had, had arrived and burned all our houses. They burnt your whole village? Yes, whole village, and they took all our belongings with them. And by that time, uh, from that time, we started uh, every night to sleep in the forest. Because they went, they, if they burnt, burnt a, a, a village, we were sure that they will come again. Because the burnt village, it was a way to force people to move they are in the area under their control. So I have this. Uh, unfortunately, no one in our family died from the civil war, but we have but, this experience. So you yourself, you had to sleep in the forest? Yes. You, you had to hide with your family? Yes. My goodness. Yeah, for about uh, one month. And some people said, no way. You have to move from this area to the area and under their control. We moved, so it, is, it was the year I did not start, and we moved. So we belonged to area under control of rivals, mm. and it was dangerous also to be recognized by the government that be you belong in that, in that area. area. Yeah. So by miracle, I escaped from that area to area under government government control, so I could. You were then protected, more protected. Yes. So, uh, but it must have been a time of of a great uh, of, of great faith for you as a family to 
to praying for your survival, for your very survival. Yes, yes, yes. It was interesting that at some time we were going to, we went to chapel, our small chapel, to pray. But somebody has to work and if watch. they are coming yeah, <laughs> to vigil, if they are coming or no. Mm. Uh, it was a challenge for us and to see that people believe. Instead of this very dangerous situation, we are still going to chapel to pray. Did you feel the presence of our Lord or Our Lady very close to you at that time? Yes, 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 yes. The, the, our Lord, brought, our Lord, always was with you. Is, was with, with you. us. Yes, especially our mother, because the feel of mad, we feel close, close our mother to our Mary. Lady, to Mary. Yes. See, see, we all, all the time, please look after us. We are in danger. We have no idea what, how this situation will end. The worst kind of war is a civil war because it brings brother against brother, yes. uh, community against community. How, does, how do you feel and how can the work of the church help in reconciliation today between the brother and brother and community and community? In Mozambique, we had a very interesting experience that as soon as the civil war finished, we, we reconciled each other. Yeah. Our former president that time, Joaquin Shisano, and the, the leader of Renamo, uh, Afonso Jacama, they made peace and publicly embarrassed, hugged. Mm. It was a good sign for us. And we started to talk to, uh, to, uh, to, each other. to each other. And I have no, I have no idea of, what, of one particular situation of uh, hate or revenge. And uh, the church, has it been active in this role of reconciliation and yes. how? Yes, our church in Mozambique was very active. And we had what I remember teams called uh, Integrador Sociais. Uh, social uh, integrators. Yes, and uh, they worked off also for the reconciliation. Okay. Before start, uh, finish, finishing the, the, the civil war, before uh, peace agreement, they started. Already? Yeah, go everywhere to gather people. Please, if the civil war finish, we don't need to uh, revenge. We have to, it happened, it happened. We have to be patient, forget, forget, otherwise, otherwise we'll start a new civil war. So it, there's no point in say, ah, you killed my father. You, no, 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 no. So the church in Mozambique was very, very, very active. So already, even before the war was over, you were planting the seeds of peace. Yes, 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 yes. Father, today, what would you say is the greatest need of the church in Mozambique? Our problem is known, is poverty. Uh, since the economy, Mozambican economy is not so good, so this, if the country is poor, the church also is poor. In fact, if I may interrupt, uh, many priests need to work also as teachers and uh, in order to make a little bit of money to continue there because the church hasn't the money to even support the priest. Yes, yeah, this is the biggest challenge now. Uh, priests are forced to teach. It's the easier job to get, to fund, yes. to teach, to earn some money for themselves, if it's possible for the church. Uh, it, this is a very challenging situation. So the church is poor. The church is poor. Uh, in some area, more or less, the situation is improving. And if we were, for example, for those people who are with us today on our program, what would your appeal be? What would your, what would your request be for those people who are with us today? If it's possible not to be tired in helping us, it would be useful. Keep helping. We are not saying that they have to help us endlessly. No, if it's possible, it's possible. They helped us in the past. If it's possible, they can, you could do, keep going, keep helping us to improve our situation. If a bishop wants to train catechists, we want to build a center, he has no money, it doesn't work. 
And for seminarians, for, ed for the priests? For seminarians, uh, we have some, some sponsor. When I prepared the project to the aid to the church in need, the answer, fortunately, it was always yes, for mass intention to improve our roof, uh, our chapel. So this kind of spirit we still we are we need it if it is possible. And maybe in the future, if our situation improves, we can help you. Yes. Yes. I, I think, in fact, this is what many people don't realize is that, in fact, it's almost a selfish help because. <laughs> We are helping a church that is exploding in terms of its faith, growing very rapidly. And you're, whereas in Europe, in the United States, in Canada, we suffer a decline in, in our faith, in the number of vocations. Mm -hmm. So it will, there will come a time when the pastors that we need will come from countries like Mozambique, Africa, India, Asia, to support us and provide the Holy Mass for us in the future. Yes. Yes, we never know. Yes, <laughs> we never know the plans of God, no? <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> now we need your support in terms of uh, knowledge, technology, uh, means or money. But maybe in the future we can help you. We never know. You never know. We never know, yes. Father Raphael, thank you for having been with us today in our program. You're welcome. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for having been with us today on Where God Weeps. And if you would like to help the Diocese of Mozambique, the seminarians, the spiritual needs that they have and material needs that they have, I would encourage you to look at the contact information at the end of this program. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Take care.